right, well, I guess we'll get started a little after seven. Thanks uh, for everybody for being here tonight. It's a nice evening. I see some, some familiar faces here tonight, so it's, uh, I appreciate you taking some time out of your evening to listen to me ramble on a little bit about skin cancer. This is a, this is a big part of my practice, um, and I hope this is informative for you. It's a very important topic, as you'll see we go through one of the more common uh, cancers that, th that there are. Just want to give you a little introduction about myself. Um, I grew up in western Pennsylvania. I did my uh, college at Mount Union, played college basketball there, and subsequently went to Maine to do my medical school. After I finished that, I went to Penn State in Hershey and did my general surgery there. I'm boarded by the American Board of Surgery and General Surgery. And after that, I went to the University of North Carolina, where I did a burn surgery fellowship and burn reconstruction fellowship there and transitioned to a faculty position after that for a year in the burn and trauma department. And when the opportunity came up to come back to central Pennsylvania, it was difficult to pass that up. I loved it here when I was in Hershey, so it was, it's good to come back to the central PA area. Okay, so what are we gonna go through tonight? Now this is just a, just a general overview. It uh, could be a mammoth uh, topic to go through. So we'll hit on just some of the main things, I think take home points that would be important for people to know. And one is just how important is being aware of skin cancer? So what are the st statistics that are out there? How common is this? And then what to look for on your skin? I think everybody has this question. What are the concerning skin lesions? Because this can be overwhelming. So this will give you some idea. You're not gonna be an expert by the end of this. Well, may maybe, but uh, it, it could be a little bit overwhelming. I hope to give you some basics of what to look for. The two main types of skin cancer, there's non-melanoma and then there's melanoma. Melanoma is the much, uh, much more significant, much more lethal skin cancer we'll talk about, but definitely more common are basal cells and squamous cells. You may have heard of these, you may have family members, there's a good chance a few of us in this room have had these uh, skin cancers. And, uh, and what can you do to protect yourself? So what are, now that we're getting into the summertime season, what are the best ways that you can you can protect yourself from uh, getting any of these cancers, particularly melanoma. So skin cancer, this is the most common cancer in the United States now. So you think about your pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, this is the most common. So definitely underrated as far as people's awareness to it, with three and a half million new cases diagnosed annually and more than 2.2 million people. That's far higher than some of the other cancers that you may think are more prevalent and more than 70,000 of these are melanoma. And we'll see a little bit later on how lethal melanoma is. That's a big number. So one in five Americans will develop skin cancer. So there's a good chance some of us in here tonight have it, will develop it, had it, new family members that do. It's very prevalent. And what's scary is that the melanoma continues to rise faster than any of the seven most common cancers that there are. So there's other good screening modalities for, say, colon cancer, which uh, if detected early is a curable disease. With skin cancer, um, if, if you're not getting regular self-exams, th these uh, particularly pigmented skin lesions can progress to melanoma if not, if not uh, uh, diagnosed by a clinician. And it's staggering that 13,000 people are gonna die this year from skin cancer, a lot of which is preventable just by routine screening. The last point I have on here, so women less than 40 diagnosed with basal cell cancer has more than doubled in the last 30 years. So there's probably some reasons you may think of as to what may cause that, but that's an important statistic. What mainly causes that is that right there. So interesting to know that there's more tanning beds, tanning salons, than there are Starbucks in more than 116 of the most populous U.S. cities. So kind of a staggering statistic. So what causes this? What is the culprit behind these wrinkles, that color, that unattractive look? And it's ultraviolet radiation. So UV rays, the immediate effects are eye damage and, and sunburn. You know that you spend too much time you don't, in the sun, you don't have sunscreen on, you get sunburn. And then the longer term effects of that, which you don't see immediately, are the premature aging of the skin and then development of skin cancers, either basal cells, squamous cells, or melanoma. So we know this is a, we know this is a known carcinogen, yet we continue to abuse it, not take protective measures for it, when we do for other things, when we know there are carcinogens, we limit their impact in our lives, but for some reason with ultraviolet radiation, people don't think it's as worrisome. So I think it's important to understand how you tan 
to understand how that process can be converted into a pathologic process. So for one, the two main culprits are UVA and UVB rays. So when you see your sunscreens that say broad spectrum sun protection, that, is, that encompasses both UVA and UVB rays. So both are detrimental and they, and they act in different ways. So UV, UVA rays, that gives you, if you spend a little time in the sun, you notice you, get, you pick up, you get a little brown color, you get that kind of that instantaneous feeling you've been in the sun. You, know, you, you take a break, you come inside, you can notice, you walk by a mirror, you notice you picked up a little color just by being outside. That's a transient effect. That's an oxidative reaction from the melanin that's in your skin, which is produced by melanocytes, which are supposed to protect you from the sun. They react with oxygen and that gives you that color. So it's that rapid stimulation that, convert, that, says the, that stimulates the melanocytes to produce melanin. The longer term effect, ultraviolet B, that is protected in sunscreen. So People think that you can't get tanned by putting on sunscreen. You can. It just takes a little bit longer. That route, that if you go this route, ultraviolet B radiation, you actually produce more melanin. You won't produce more melanocytes, but they'll make more melanin, which actually is a protective mechanism for more exposure to the sun. So slow, gradual tanning is, if you're going to tan, that's the ideal way to do it without putting yourself at too much risk. But definitely sunscreen makes a big difference. Broad spectrum protection against UVA and UVB rays. And if you just can't wait, then you jump in one of these, and this is definitely accelerant to get cancer. Somehow that's just ac acceptable, though, that these, uh, tan these tanning salons can, can profit off people's ignorance about the, the harmful effects of UVA and UVB rays. So what if your doctor says that you need to go tanning because you have acne or your skin could, I think everybody has heard this at some point in time, that, that tanning is, has some therapeutic effect, that it is good to, to go to help your skin tone, help your skin color. And that's particular with uh, psoriasis. So uh, adding sorolin combined with UVA and UVB rays, which is a treatment for psoriasis, is an acceptable modality. But there's increased risk with that too for squamous cell cancers. So even though basal cell may not be higher in these patients, squamous cell cancers are. So there's, it's, it's not a one-to-one uh, -one trade off that you're getting your psoriasis treated without risk. There is still risk, and you're running a risk particularly for squamous cell cancer, which as I'll go through a little, in a little while, uh, that has a risk to be potentially metastatic disease. It's low, but it's, it's, a, it's a real entity. So this is another interesting uh, statistic that I came across, that women that use tanning beds greater than six times during high school or college were more likely to develop uh, basal cell than women that didn't during that same time frame. And that 60% increased risk for developing a basal cell carcinoma at or before the age of 50. And that's a significant statistic that, that uh, is underappreciated. Kind of what goes along the lines of this is that uh, this is just a marker for how these people behave in the sun. So they tend to not wear sunscreen. They tend to have more sun exposure, which puts that at even more risk from laying in a tanning bed. Okay, so what to look for. These are all just very common skin ailments that you may see on your skin. So I don't want people to be totally scared or turned off by this lecture, like, oh my goodness, I have a little thing like that on my nose. Is that going to turn into some of the photographs we'll see later on? So everybody, after these lectures tends to just worry a little bit more. They tend to uh, maybe go see, go see a doctor to get a, a, a skin screening after these. The vast majority of these tend to be benign, but you need to be aware of what to look for for ones that are going to convert into a malignancy. And that's what I hope what you get tonight, because these, we see these every day on people and conversations that we have. We notice these skin lesions on people. But what should you be worried about? So look for new growths, spots, bumps, patches, sores that don't heal after several weeks. That is key to making uh, a diagnosis of a skin cancer or making the decision to biopsy to look into that if, that, if that is what needs to be done. For men and women, for men shaving their face, for women shaving legs, underarms, cuts that don't heal uh, in a few days, they can be skin cancer. So that's something to be aware too. You nick your face, there's a little mole that was maybe there you didn't notice before, it bleeds, happens a few times. That's something that's worthwhile to get checked out. So what happens when ultraviolet radiation targets these moles, there's melanin, there's pigment in this. So what happens is that pigment undergo, or that melanin produced by melanocytes, 
that causes a DNA change within that cell. And I'll show you a histology so slide here shortly. You can see some of the cells that make up the layers of the skin. That distortion of the normal DNA cycle causes these cells to turn over rapidly. And that causes a change in the normal expression of the cell that, to become cancerous. So it could be a cumulative. We'll go through some of the risk factors. It could be a family history of that change happening. It could be triggered by ultraviolet light. It could be triggered by some immune factors that you have. So there's something that happened within that once normal appearing mole that caused this turnover to happen. So we'll go through some of that. That's a very good question because you're thinking all along that this is a normal appearing mole. What's the trigger to turn that into something malignant potentially? So we'll go through some of those risk factors here shortly too. <coughs> So this is just a general schematic of what your skin looks like if you were to take a cross-section of it. So this top layer, this is the top layer of everyone's skin. There's five different layers to that. Not important to know what each of those layers are. But just know there's two main components of skin. This, the epidermis, and then your dermis, which is where your hair follicles are located, your blood vessels, your collagen, where the strength layer of the skin is down here. Where the, where the cancer starts with basal cell and squamous cells are in this, so it's in this layer here. Just Within the epidermis, these skin cells, called squamous skin cells, lined by basal, basal cells, those are the ones responsible for whatever triggers that change to happen, to develop into a cancer. So this is happening at the very top, the very surface of, of the skin that these changes take place. This is where it gets a little confusing because basal cells can present in a lot of different ways. They can be flat, firm, pale areas, raised areas, scaly areas. Uh, pinkish growth with raised centers. They can be open sores that don't heal, that are crusting. Typically, this is what a classic basal cell looks like, and I don't know how well this projects, but there are little tiny, little tiny blood vessels within that skin lesion. It almost looks like a little pearly papule that has some blood vessels in it. That's kind of a classic presentation for what a basal cell looks like. They can also look like this. There's some blood vessels here. This is a flat, uh, plaque. This almost looks like a, a punched out or a skin lesion that had a portion of the center removed. And this just looks like a scar. But all of these can present as basal cells. And this is the challenging part for patients to recognize some of these changes need to be evaluated. So you're the only one looking at your skin every day. So to be able to notice subtle changes or skin lesions that look similar to that is, is an important tip off. On the other hand, our squamous cell carcinomas, those look different. Sometimes they can look similar, but for the most part, they have this classic appearance of kind of this open sore with a punched out center. Basal cells can look like that too. This looks a little bit rougher, a little bit more aggressive than that earlier picture that I showed you. These can look like warts too, so it's not uncommon. Patients will come and say, I had this wart treat, I had it frozen for a number of years, it keeps coming back. If something's been there for a while, it has been refractory to treatments, that's a tip off that this may be a malignancy. So it looks, it feels like a scab that flakes off. So almost like just the top layer of pie crust that's little thin scales that come off. When you just rub your skin, you put your clothes on, you notice the little brush against it causes some flaking to come off. So th this is the, th the top layer of the skin that's affected. So it's not the dermal layer that all these changes are happening. So the skin is trying to, it's turning over rapidly, it's trying to shed itself, and that's what you're noticing when you see these, these flakes. That's what's meant by crusting. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's definitely precursor lesions that lead into skin cancers, particularly squamous cell cancers. So they start out as little benign patches. You've all seen these little scaly, Plaques, they're flat, they have little scales on, they may be brownish plaques. <coughs> these are benign. These have, these have no uh, malignancy in, in and of themselves. But again, there's a trigger that causes them to turn into it. And if patients have these actinic keratoses, they don't just have one or two, they have a lot. And they have them in different areas, particularly in the hands, usually in sun exposed areas. So you're not going to necessarily see as many on the back if it's covered by a shirt that that hasn't had a lot of sun exposure, but typically the face, the hands, and the scalp. So this is a challenging problem because any one of these skin lesions could be an actinic keratosis that's going to undergo a malignant transformation. So patients like this need to be followed by a physician that knows what these look like and makes a determination whether or not these need to be biopsied. So not every actinic keratosis is going to progress to squamous cell. In fact, the, ma the vast majority are not. The vast majority go away on their own. 
But in cases like this, these, any one of these skin lesions here can change. And in fact, they're probably in various stages that some people may never know. They may just stay a quiescent skin cancer. But being regularly screened, regularly evaluated helps make that determination so that something doesn't get missed. So little beauty spots. These aren't a problem. I mean, this, this is what some models make their career on are these little, not even, they're not imperfections, they're just little distinctions. And they, they don't need to be removed. To remove this creates a, a scar. So there's no trade-off if you have a skin lesion that needs to come off. There's always a scar that, that comes with it. So to take off a skin lesion like this could potentially cause distortion to the lip. It can cause a longer scar that, that comes close to the nose depending on the way the tissue is reoriented to, to reconstruct it. So not everything needs to, to come off. And in this case, this adds personality and character to people. So the vast majority are, of these moles are fine. They're not going to progress to anything. But you need to be aware of size, shape, color, because that's the sign that melanoma could be being produced. So melanoma is, a, is different from basal and squamous cells in that melanoma develops within pigmented lesions. There are some melanomas that can be what's called amelanotic melanoma, meaning they have no melanin, they have no color to them. They're just pale moles, raised areas on the skin. But what melanoma develops from, are, it's a malignancy of melanocytes, malignancy of moles. It's not just de novo, it doesn't just come from radiation to skin where there's not pigment. So that's the difference between what makes a melanoma a melanoma and what makes a basal cell and a squamous cell a squamous cell. It's, it's the cell of origin that they come from. So if there's any slide that's important tonight, it's, it's this slide. And this is really the take home point here. And it's easy to remember, A, B, C, D, E. So this is what you should go by at home when you're looking at your moles in the mirror. And this is why photography, serial photography is helpful too, especially for somebody that has quite a bit of, of moles, because it's impossible when you're seeing a, seeing a clinician for the first time for them to know what this looked like before. So seeing them early, having photographs routinely allows clinicians to make that determination as to what moles are uh, worrisome. So we'll go through each of these. So asymmetry. If you were to take a, just a line through the middle of this, this half should look like this half. That's a symmetric appearing mole. So it's obvious that this is asymmetric if you split it right in half. Does that mean that, that this is malignant and you're going to die of melanoma? No, it, it doesn't. But it's one of those things that factors into the, to the decision to investigate this further, whether biopsy, or with serial uh, exams. So the other, border. This is nice and circular. This is not. This also has some other characteristics too. Uh, this is a little pale area here compared to this, so there's some color variation. If this were a bigger area that uh, was initially affected by a darker pigment and now looks normal, that's something called regression, and that is potentially a, a more worrisome sign. So if you had a larger pigmented area that's now smaller, looks like this, that potentially could be uh, a melanoma. Color is important too, so is it darkly pigmented? Is it scattered throughout? Does it change over time? So you need to be aware of that too. And then diameter. So six millimeters is an easy number to remember for me, but for the layperson, just think about the tip of a pencil eraser. So if a lesion is bigger than that, that potentially is worrisome. Does that mean you have melanoma if you have one bigger than that? Absolutely not. But especially if it's changed over time, that's important to know. And then evolving. So this, is, this doesn't project that well, but there's a tiny pigmented skin lesion here. And you can see per perhaps it's a little bit bigger there. So that has evolved over time into a larger lesion. So when I see patients, I go through this all the time to get some idea as to what their risk is and if it warrants uh, a biopsy to be done. If I, if I know the skin lesion has changed <coughs> significantly over the past month, that's a little bit more worrisome for me. Um, if it has a lot of other characteristics, maybe it's slow growing, but maybe the color has changed significantly or the border has changed rapidly, uh, but the size has been the same for the past few years, then may, it, it, there's a lot of things that factor in. Family history is one. What are your other medical conditions? Have you had previous melanomas or other skin cancers? So this is a good schematic, good kind of um, acronym, just for just letters to remember to kind of get you
thinking about what potentially could be worrisome and then take that information to your physician. Okay, so of the non-melanotic skin lesions, these are by far the most common. There's Merkel cell, there's also an entity called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, which falls under this category. These are much more rare. These are aggressive, but in the umbrella of what falls under what's not melanoma and what could be harmful to you, this is the umbrella right here. But by far, these two are the most common. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. But just for completeness sake, there are other skin cancers that are not melanomas that are aggressive too. So getting to your point earlier, what are, what are risk factors? So definitely phenotype. If you look like this girl, as attractive as that it may be, she is at highest risk for development of melanoma. So she's pale, she's redhead, freckles, uh, definitely, sorry Tim, at higher risk uh, of developing uh, melanoma. So family history plays into account too. So about 10% of patients that have melanoma generally have a family history of melanoma, and that can develop at any, at any age. Dr. Question, family yeah. history meaning immediate family? Immediate, first degree relatives. Yeah, first degree relatives. Uh, predisposing lesions. So again, this gentleman with all these actinic keratoses, if he, if he comes to me and says, you know, I have this skin lesion that's changing, and I look at this sea of skin lesions on his, we had just had a case today where we had a, uh, where we had removed a melanoma from a scalp and actually had, had the melanoma addressed but had in process, in the process of removing that melanoma encroached on another skin cancer. Took a little bit more tissue, encroached on another skin cancer and then another skin. So this is, this is, these patients are difficult to manage. These are better to be followed early on so that you can catch changes so that they don't result in a massive operation where a good portion of the scalp is removed and you need to have a significant reconstruction to, to, to close that hole. That's how we spent our day today. Uh, so immu immunological, there's, there's conditions, genetic conditions uh, that lack certain enzymes that can process um, some of the, the damage that's done by ultraviolet radiation. Uh, so that definitely plays into effect. Patients that are HIV positive or who have other immune issues lack the ability for the immune system to attack some of these DNA changes and can, that can develop into a, a, to a skin cancer. Also environmental factors such as radiation. We've gone through UV radiation but also ionizing radiation. So that's if you have breast cancer and you get radiation or if you have a sarcoma in your leg that you get radiation. So therapeutic conventional medicine treatments can actually induce a skin cancer. So you have to weigh the benefit and the risk to each of them, but certainly if you have a sarcoma and you need to have radiation, you should have it, but you're also at a little higher risk for, uh, for cancer. So along with precursor lesions, this is a totally benign lesion. This is something called a Hutchinson freckle. This is a, not even necessarily a precursor to invasive melanoma, but it is a, it's a lentigo uh, malignant melanoma that's non-invasive. So it's a benign skin lesion, but it looks worrisome. So by being seen regular, regularly by a physician, um, you know, that can give you some peace of mind too, that something that's worrisome like this is, is, a, benign, is a benign skin lesion. Okay, so we'll go through these a little bit more in depth now. Uh, so basal cell, again, this is the most common. And if you've had one, there's a good chance you're gonna have another one, fairly soon too. The good news about this is that metastatic disease is very rare. These tend to cause just local tissue destruction. That may sound not so bad, but in some of the other photos, I'll show you what it looks like to neglect one of these for 10 years. And most of these are present on the face and head, just because that's where you're getting your sun exposure. Particularly in this climate, this is a farming community, um, a lot of sun exposure. Face and head are the most common areas for these to present. There's different subtypes. The subtypes are not necessarily as important to you, but to as the clinician it is, because these can be treated differently. There's, not, there's lesser aggressive subtypes that can be treated with just simple topical measures. And so um, from that, there's also more aggressive subtypes it, that necessitate surgical techniques to remove them. There's different techniques. When a patient gets sent to me for removal, I usually take 
an accepted margin of normal tissue around that skin lesion that allows for the cancer to be removed, uh, but then it creates a, a defect that needs to be reconstructed. Dermatologists do a procedure, you may have heard this called Mohs. Mohs, Mohs is, is good for these higher risk skin lesions, basal cells. Micronodular is one, morpheiform, or if they happen in a cosmetically sensitive area, so on the face. So what Mohs does is it does the same thing that I do in the operating room, but it takes smaller margins of healthy, healthy tissue around the area. And then the uh, dermatologist looks at that under a microscope at all the margins, every one of them, to see if there's any microscopic evidence of, of disease. They could be lengthy procedures because of that, but it also spares the most amount of tissue. So a millimeter may not sound like much in the face, but if it's near an eyelid that needs to be reconstructed, a one millimeter makes a big difference in what I need to do to fix things. So Mohs is definitely an option for some of these, and that's an important discussion for you to have with your physician. If you have a basal cell, am I a candidate for Mohs? Should I have Mohs? What is Mohs? So at least you've heard of it now. You know that there's an entity out there that can spare tissue in cosmetically sensitive areas for high-risk skin cancers. Otherwise, what I generally do is take about two millimeters of tissue in the operating room, and I have the pathologist look at it at that time, and then they tell me whether or not I need to take more. But Mohs is definitely a, a great way to um, spare as much tissue as you, as, you, as you can. These are just some more examples of what are basal cells. This has almost a little indentation here. It's hard to appreciate from this slide, uh, but it's almost like a crater appearance to that. This is a flat plaque, which I'm sure we've seen many times on us that have healed and gone away, but it's the ones that don't heal and go away that are worrisome. So squamous cells, the other one that I'm going to talk about tonight, and that's the second most common, and this is definitely due to that just too much sun exposure that causes this, these DNA changes within the cells. And these are due to pre, can be due to precursor lesions like you have seen, actinic keratosis converts into uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ when there's a small amount of atypia or a small amount of cells that start to change into something malignant. So it hasn't become a malignancy yet, but it's not normal. And then that progresses to invasive cell carcinoma. Uh, and the treatments for that are similar for basal cell in that surgical excision. There are some topical therapies for less aggressive ones uh, or surgical excision without, with or without Mohs um, are, both, are both options. Radiation therapy is also good for squamous cell. So in areas of the scalp where the tumor may grow deep and, and a portion of bone for whatever reason is not warranted to be removed, patient age, comorbidities, patient choice, Radiation is, is a choice, too, for, for what's considered positive margins. We're still having residual cancer left after, after surgical excision. So a little bit more about melanoma. There's four different types of melanoma. Again, the types are not important, just to know that there are subtypes to it. So just because you have melanoma, they're not all created the same. So some are definitely more aggressive than others. So acral litiginous melanoma is relatively uncommon, but in dark-skinned individuals, this happens to be one of the, the most common types of melanoma that they get. About 30 to 45% of the time, if they're going to get melanoma, it's going to be this. Uh, superficial spreading is the most common, whereas lenticular malignant is the least aggressive. That was that Hutchinson freckle that you saw that undergoes some malignant change. It doesn't happen often. That's why those need to be followed, but those tend to be less aggressive. The aggressiveness has to do with how these tumors grow within the mole that's there. So they tend to grow out first in what's called a radial growth phase and then down. So they don't need to go down that much. We're talking millimeters of tissue penetration to make a significant impact on survival. Not prognosis, survival. And I'll show you what a, what a, what a survival curve looks like here shortly. But this is what, how melanoma can penetrate. So just penetration to one millimeter makes you stage one disease. Beyond a millimeter, stage two. If it goes into your lymph nodes, you're at stage three disease. So one, one we're talking just small amount of millimeter penetration can, can cause this. And then stage four is when the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, and it's spread to other organs. So this is the survival rates. And you may look at this and say, oh, it's stage one disease, that, you know, that's not so bad. But if you just look at between two and three years, this is for like a millimeter, potentially, less than a millimeter, even so, if there's ulceration within a 0.4 millimeter melanoma, you're, you're, a sta you're a stage one melanoma, stage one B. And at three years, your survival rate is good, but it's not 
And as you go out here to 10 years, you may still say, that's good, but that's not 100%. And this is a small, penetrating skin cancer. If it goes to the nose, your five-year survival rate's right around 50%. So melanoma is not anything to be joked around with, not to be taken seriously. You need to protect yourself in the sun because these, these are real changes. And I'll show you some of the photographs that look like young, healthy people that have had big operations. So what can you do to protect yourself? And this is important too. So just, it's simple enough. You, how many times you drive by a drugstore, Walmart, Target, just, that has sunscreen. You just need to wear, wear sunscreen. And that can reduce your cancer significantly by that. And there's even been trials that have been done to show that there's no harmful effects from using sunscreen. So there's advocates that say, oh, you don't want to use sunscreen, there's too many chemicals and I can get skin cancer from that. Well, there's, there's no adverse effects from sunscreen use. So what can you do after tonight? Regular dermatology or family medicine exams. I don't do routine screenings, but when there's issues that arise from them, then I, then I see patients, especially if they're within cosmetically sensitive areas. Regular self exam, so be proactive about this. Look in the mirror. Have your spouse, your significant other help you look at some worrisome areas. Take photographs. Be proactive about it. Sun protective clothing. So this, there's, there's SPF factors to different types of clothing that you can wear. So all this on top of wearing sunscreen just adds to your protective effect. No tanning beds. That is the absolute worst thing you can do for yourself by going to a tanning bed. Along those same lines, no tanning beds. So definitely <laughs> stay away from them, okay? They're, they try to suck your money from you and give you cancer. Just in case it wasn't clear, no tanning beds. Just stay away from them. So are there, there are some other things I do I just want to talk about here briefly. So in addition to skin cancer, um, as, as uh, being a plastic surgeon, I, I do a, a full line of other cosmetic and reconstructive procedures uh, from eyelid surgery to facelifts to breast surgery, uh, hand surgery as well too. Uh, body contouring after uh, significant weight loss surgery. Cool sculpting, which is a non-invasive fat, permanent fat loss removal um, that that's, some patients are excellent candidates for that don't want to undergo liposuction. We do that right in the, off, the privacy of the office. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful modality that's just recently kind of, you may have heard some ads on the radio about cool sculpting and freezing fat, and that's what this modality is, cool sculpting. The other thing that, uh, and I have Judy here tonight with me too, she's part of our team, uh, that we do re breast reconstruction. We're passionate about that, uh, along with skin cancer. With my burn training, we do uh, burn scar reconstruction, abdominal wall reconstruction, chronic wounds. And then we have a full skin care line too, as well. So the, the IPL laser I talked about earlier for treating just some benign pigmented skin lesions on your face uh, can do other things as far as collagen tightening as well too to kind of give that youthful appearance as well. So I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer some questions. If I hope this was informative tonight too, a little bit about kind of what to look for. Well, um, for like a treatment of removing the wall, anything mm -hmm. on the face, so is it always um, the same treatment or is it different? That's a good question. So um, it depends. So if it has some of those features, it's grown in size, the borders are regular, it bleeds. Um, most of the time it is covered by insurance, but it has to have some of those features too. Otherwise, it's just considered to be a cosmetic removal of a mole. So like I said, the vast majority of these are benign, but if it has those changes, that, if it has enough of those, it's worrisome to have it checked out. Here's another question. Uh, back when I was young, for a good number of decades ago, Anybody that lived in Lancaster, generally, their family had always lived here, but over the last five, four, six decades, people from out of town have come to live in this area, as an example yourself. Yeah. Those who come from higher elevations, such as the Rockies, are they have a greater chance of developing skin cancer? That's a good question. So it has to do with the amount of UV exposure. So if you're the ozone is thin or the air is thin, does that increase your risk? Probably not to a significant degree. Um, I think just the amount of time that you're spending out in the, in the sun uh, without protection is probably the most important factor. So um, really understand the importance of a broad spectrum sunscreen is your best protection. 
I think no matter where no matter where you are. If you're closer to the equator, does that make an effect? Absolutely. Yes. The intensity of the sun is is more so. Whether or not that translates into elevation, um, I don't know for certain, but definitely closer to the equator <coughs> makes makes a big difference. So those vacations to the Caribbean and whatnot, those are cumulative over a lifetime. So, yeah. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate y'all's attention tonight. I hope this was helpful, at least to get the conversation started. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have up here. So thanks. Thank you.